bound my shackles of this earth. From the dust I was created. To the dust I will return. For a glorious resurrection. Restored and raised to life, recreated in your presence. You may dust your grand design, you may dust your grand Come on, church, from wherever you are today, let's put our hands together and praise Him. Here we go.
Good morning, church. It is great to be here with you guys. Thank you so much for joining us online this morning. Uh, if you have not been with us before, we are so grateful to have you. Please uh, drop us a line with the information that was provided in the slides before. We'd love to hear from you. And uh, we just want to take this moment before we get into our worship and praise to just pray, God, God, we love you, Lord. We expect just amazing things this morning, but God, because you are always faithful, Lord, and we love you. We just pray for those who are needing you most right now. We pray, Lord, for, for those we know that are hurting, for those uh, who are down in Cuba who are still dealing with, with so, many, so many issues with their government, Lord, and we just, uh, we just lift them up to you this morning, God, and we just want to just give you all the praise. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Show us, show us your glory. 
Straight up. 
strength of my soul. Your love defends me. Your love defends me. And when I feel like I'm all God, we thank you this morning, God. We thank you for being our defender, Lord. Lord, we thank you for being the one that is with us through the battles that is right beside us, God. And we just, we give you all praise, Lord. There is nothing, there is nothing that we can't get through the way that we're supposed to without you, God. And we love you. We just give you our hearts this morning. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Welcome to our time of communion. Now, we do practice open communion for all those who believe. And part of my meditation for this week has been in 1 Corinthians, and actually in chapter 10, uh, down basically from verses 16 all the way through 23. First, I'd like to take a look at something, which is something that the writer asked us to look at. And that was the Israelis from a human point of view, where he wrote, those who eat the sacrifices share in what is on the altar. And he asked the question, don't they? Am I suggesting that an offering made to idols means not anything or that an idol itself means anything? Hardly. What they offer, they offer to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to become partners with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot dine with the Lord and dine with demons. Or you'll provoke the Lord to jealousy. Isn't that right? Are we stronger than he is? I don't think so. I want to back up just for a second here and talk a little bit more about this offering. The sacrifice, that's who Jesus is to us. He is the sacrifice. He took our sin, he took our penalties, he took our sinful life, and he took it to the cross. And in doing so, he gave us his life, a righteous life, a clean and pure life, just like the sacrifices that Israel was told to bring to the altar. They were to be without spot, without wrinkle, blameless, innocent, and sufficient to cover their sins because there was an exchange going on. Now, I want you to listen to what it says in verse 16 of this same chapter. In talking to sensible people, and I'm saying that to you, 
The cup of blessing that we bless is our fellowship in the blood of the Messiah. Isn't that right? The bread that we break is our fellowship in the body of the Messiah. Isn't that right? Because there's only one loaf, we who are many are one body. And because all of us eat from the same loaf, that brings us all together in that one body. And that one body is sacrificed for us. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is why we remember that on the night before he was crucified, he took bread and he broke it. He gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body broken for you. Eat. And they ate. And after they had eaten, he took the cup and he filled it with wine. He passed it to them and said, this is the blood that I shed for the salvation of many. Drink. And so we drink. And we take to ourselves the body of Christ, the life of Christ that is ours to live and live in the honor and praise and thanksgiving to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so we pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for this day. Thank you for your blessings of, through this offering. Lord, for the sacrifice that your son Jesus made on that cross. Lord, to give us the opportunity to walk blamelessly before the throne, asking what we might, expecting your blessing through all good things, knowing what we need and what we don't need. Lord, we ask you to bless us today in Jesus' name. Amen. As he blesses us, so we should bless others. We also ask that in support of others, you might support the things that we do here in this church, in this building, the missions. Lord, we have many, many things that we do in, that require us to spend money, spend time, and we ask that these efforts, Lord, be brought to fullness through the donations of all those who give, both of their money, their time, their effort. If you would like to give, we have an online presence at Coquille Christian Community Church where you're welcome to give. You could come to our office and give. You can come to the church and spend time. And join us in helping to spread the word that has brought so much freedom and joy to millions over the time. We just thank you for your patience being with us this morning. Bless you. Good morning, and I want to welcome you to week nine in our Summer on the Mount series. Now, some things in life look really simple until you try it for yourself. For instance, hitting a golf ball. It's just laying there. It's still. Nobody's throwing it 90 miles an hour at you. It's not breaking this way or that. It's just, well, it's just sitting there. Why is it so hard to make it where I want it? to go make it go that direction or how about this one shooting a free throw it looks so simple and yet you see people in the nba that struggle with it nobody's guarding you it's only 15 feet everybody should make it every single time especially men that are paid millions and millions of dollars just to shoot a ball how about this one some assembly required <laughs> 
Ikea is another way to spell the word evil. How about this one? Being a parent. You get to stay up as late as you want when you're growing up, right? You spend money on whatever you feel like. You tell your kids what to do. Well, that's what I thought parenting was going to be like anyway. Here's three of them I've tried. Coaching, preaching, and refereeing. Sometimes, no matter where you are, somebody in the crowd thinks that they can do a better job than you can at it. I would simply offer to you that all of those are harder than they look. And how about praying? There are a whole lot of people who say they pray until you ask them to do it. It doesn't look all that hard. But some stumble to say anything, and some just ramble on. Some say the same things, the same words over and over, never thought uh, about anything they're actually saying. When we pray in public, we focus on the people rather than God. And when we pray in private, we spend the whole time talking about ourselves. It's harder than it looks. The disciples realized it, and they asked Jesus to teach them how to pray. And this is what Jesus said in response to that very specific request. Chapter 6, verse 9 says, This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, I don't suppose at the time that Jesus meant for this to be something that we memorize and repeat with some sort of disengaged mind and heart. It's, a, it's more like a, a skeleton, an outline, or maybe a guide to help you to organize your prayers. And two things really jump out at me when I examine this prayer with fresh eyes. It starts by completely centering on God. It starts by centering on God, and then it moves to us. Us, if you read it, not me, us. It's not first person singular. There's no I in this anywhere. Me, my, mine, there's none of that in the whole prayer. Now the first part makes sense, starting out with God, centering on God, first because he's the one that we are addressing. Second, everything else flows from who God is. And that leads to this. Sometimes we are just tempted to make him too small. He's the one. He's the great God. Spend just a moment at the beginning to list some of his attributes, right? He's mighty. He's the creator. Look at the stars, each one of them representing a possibly a set of worlds that he has made. He's sovereign, which means he has complete and total authority. He's omniscient, means he knows all that can possibly be known. He's eternal. He's everlasting. He has no beginning and no end. He's immutable, which means he's never changing. He's completely consistent. He's self-sufficient. God has no needs. He, cannot meet, he has no needs that he cannot meet for himself. God is trustworthy. He's faithful and unchangeably true. He is good and merciful and just, and the list goes on and on. And when we begin to grasp with our little minds all that we can catch about who God really is, When we know that he is the recipient of our prayers, it's very logical for us that we should start by focusing on him. And Jesus teaches us to pray beginning with focusing on our amazing God. He's all that, but you can also call him dad, our father. See, I hear the word father and I think formal or stiff, sometimes even distant. This here, this word we use, it's dad. Pops, Papa. And that's, well, church, that's amazing. It's mind-blowing. His audience thought his name was too holy to utter. And Jesus said, you don't have to use his name. Just call him Daddy. You see, because right here, Jesus is revealing to us another huge piece of who God really is. The Almighty One desires intimacy with us. He invites us to crawl up on his lap to sit across the table with a cup of coffee, to walk together side by side in the woods. Our Father in heaven. And actually translated, it's heavens. 
doesn't include the clouds and our atmosphere and the sun and the moon and the stars and that place where we'll be with him someday, heaven. Yeah, he is on his throne, worthy of honor, but expressing that the desire of his heart is to be close to you. He's all that a dad should be and more, full of goodness and compassion and forgiveness and care, all of that with no limits. And he invites us to get close. And if you can take only one thing away from today, let it be this. God invites you to come close. No matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, he made you in his image. And he wants a deep personal relationship like a good dad does. And Jesus reminds us that while it can be personal, it still needs to be respectful. Hallowed be your name. That's not a term we hear very often. It means revered, honored, set apart. To treat differently means uniquely positioned. Your name is to be treated with respect. See, we live in a world that's losing the concept of hallowed. The American flag once was hallowed, but it's not really so much anymore. The elderly were once treated with honor. People stood when an older person walked in a room. Young people gave up their seats. There was a time when the younger listened and valued the wisdom and experience that taught the elderly. See, positions of authority were once respected. The office of the President of the United States, teachers, parents, the police, but not really anymore, not in some circles. And yet there is one name in all of history that we're commanded not to use in vain, to respect and not to use as a curse word. And what is the one name that is common profanity? Well, it's, it's God's. Have you ever heard someone get mad and just scream out, Oh, Elvis! The only one forbidden is the only one that's used. It tells us something about how rebellious we really are in our spirits. Even believers don't even notice when they abuse his name. It's so casually used. When we pray, we need to pause and remember who we are meeting with. To treat him with deference. Respect his power and his position. Your kingdom come. See, a kingdom requires a king. And a king has authority. He is the primary decision maker. When respect is in place, submission to authority comes a lot easier. Your kingdom come. Well, what, what really does that mean? I think that it might mean that I'm praying for the salvation to come to the lives of those around me. I pray others will submit to your authority and claim you as their Lord and Savior. But it could be referring to the day when Jesus returns. Either way, I'm okay. I want both of those things to happen. I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I pray for the lost to find Jesus, and I look forward to his return when when this place may be destroyed. And we experience a new heaven and a new earth with God on his throne. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What do, you, what do you hear in that? So many of us blame so many things on God, right? On God's will. Horrible things happen and we blame God. A child dies. Someone will say that's God's will. A tornado wipes out a family. We call that an act of God. Let me tell you something. God does not act that way. When Lazarus died, Jesus grieved. He got angry. The death of his friend wasn't God's will. His friend died because we live in a fallen world, a broken world. Sin introduced death and pain and suffering and all of its ugliness. Sin brought that into our world. And thorns and thistles and whatever you can think of. Look it up in Genesis chapter 3. All of creation reacted when sin entered the picture. God's will is never a bad thing. It is for things to be as they were meant to be. But with that, in that same circle, 
God gives us something we call free will. He does not impose His will upon us. He could. I mean, He's certainly mighty enough to force us to do whatever He chooses. But He doesn't. He affirms that He has given all of us the right to choose. But His desire is that our hearts will align with His. For His will to be done on earth, we who understand and accept His authority must be the means by which it is going to be done here on earth. You see, prayer really is about alignment. God first, then us. It's His will, not my will. This is the God I want to learn to want what you want, Lord, in my prayers. Even when I don't understand, even when I don't agree, I believe that your way is the best way. I trust you. I trust, God, that you are wise. I trust that you love me, that you have my best interest at heart. Make the one thing that I want more than all the others, your will, in my life, in my world. Make that important. And there's one other part of this petition that's worth noting. Learning to pray for his will prepares us for when we get to heaven. God's will reigns supreme in heaven. In heaven, sin does not break the flow of his will. He could intervene there, but to do so seals the fate of the lost. God is patient, not wanting anyone to perish. He wants everyone here to have the chance to turn to him on their own. So sin works to destroy his will. See, that won't be the case in heaven. We're preparing ourselves to fully appreciate all that we will experience when we get there. Seeking his will, recognizing his will. Carrying out his will is prep work for what lies ahead for those that follow him. Jesus teaches us to pray by addressing the issues of the heart. It's our attitude that needs to be right. First, the way that we think about God, and then the way we think about our personal needs. Give us this day our daily bread. It's interesting that day and daily are used both in the same sentence. It kind of sounds redundant, but it's because the term here that's translated daily is only found here. That's right, only ever. Nowhere else in the entire Bible or in any other piece of literature from that time period, as a matter of fact. And frankly, we aren't 100% positive what that word means. Some believe it relates to time, daily, today. Some believe it's about tomorrow. Give us enough today that we won't worry about tomorrow. And some believe it refers to an amount. Give us enough, or give the portion that never runs out. Which one is right? Honestly? I don't know. (laughs) I understand it to mean provide what we'll need, as much as we will need, and when we need it. What I see in this is the word contentment. He didn't pray for cake when bread would do, right? It'll sustain, and I will be satisfied. What I see in this is a, is a gift. It's not a right. We didn't create it. It's a loan from the Creator. And what I see in it is this is ours, not mine. There's a good story. Uh, Mother Teresa told of a night when an older gentleman came to her house and said there was a family with eight children that had nothing to eat. And he asked if there was anything that we could do. She got some rice and took it to them. And when she got there, the mother took the rice, divided it into two equal portions, and left. And as she waited, Mother Teresa could see the faces of the hungry children. And after a moment, that woman returned. And Mother Teresa asked her where she had been. And the answer came, was quick and it was simple, says, they are hungry too. You see, they were the family next door. Mother Teresa reflected on that moment. I was not as surprised that she gave as I was surprised that she knew. In her terrible bodily suffering, she knew next door they were hungry also. It was not my rice. It was our rice. And too few of us get that. Instead, we see as necessity what is really a luxury. Air conditioning. Yeah, I turn it on my car when I'm driving to Coos Bay because it gets too loud in my car to hear podcasts very well on my phone when my windows are down. 
it gets hot in my car with the windows up, so air conditioning. But let me tell you, not hotter than almost many third world countries are every day of the week. Indoor plumbing, plumbing. more sanitary, yes. But in much of the world necessary, no. Computers, cell phones, try living without yours for even one day. You see, our prayers reflect the confusion that first world problems create. My family has never known what it is to be hungry. All they know is frustration if their preferred snack wasn't available in the refrigerator. But my family never worried about what we will have or if we would have food for supper. Why? They probably never gave a thought to the fact that they had a father who loves and provides for them. The prayer teaches us to acknowledge that gap that comes between need and want and to be content with what we're given. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. This concept was so important that it's repeated after the prayer. Forgive as we forgive. Now there are five terms used in, to describe sin in the Bible. And each paints a slightly different picture of what sin looks like in that scenario. The most common is to miss the mark. It's a picture of a bullseye and an archer's arrow that had missed the center. It goes astray. It missed the mark. Another idea is to step across the line. The line that's clearly marked. Don't go there. And you know where that line is. You can see it. And you intentionally, you willfully step across that line. We've all been there and probably all done that. And then there's to slip across the line. I crossed the line, but I didn't mean to. It was unintentional. It was uh, Another term for that would be unwitting. Another expression is what is known as a high-handed sin. This is a defiant, shake-your-fist-in-the-face-of-God sin. I know what's right, and I know what's wrong, and I'm going to do what I want to do, and you can't stop me. As you shake your fist in God's face. And then here, and only here, Jesus refers to sin as an unpaid debt. It's a failing to do that which is required. You see, all of these other sins refer to a sin of commission. Things I do. This one refers to a sin of omission. Things I neglected. This reminds me of, of Matthew chapter 25 when Jesus says, I was hungry and you left me hungry. I needed some clothes and you left me naked and bare. I was sick and you ignored me. I was in prison and you abandoned me. It's all about what we neglected to do for someone else. It's interesting that this line lays next to the petition for daily bread. Your neighbor didn't come through for you? Forgive him. What he's done is no worse than what you've done to God. Let me ask you this. When you first came to God, one of the appealing pieces was forgiveness, wasn't it? I mean, how long has it been now? How long since you needed forgiveness? How long have you gone without sinning? A month? A week? A couple of days? A few hours? Five minutes? <laughs> That's what I thought. Because what you need to understand is that forgiveness has to, it needs to be a daily part of our lives, both offering and the receiving of forgiveness. Church, it is not about deserving it. Don't even go there. All right? It's not about whether the guilty party confessed they're wrong, how many sins you've forgotten uh, in this period of time. Because let's face it, how many sins have you committed in your life that you forgot to ask God's uh, blessing on? How many times have you forgotten to confess them? And it's not just blowing it off and saying that it doesn't matter, because church, it does. It did, or it wouldn't be bothering you as you thought about it. But don't think your sin doesn't bother the holy, holy and just God. He paid for your sin with the blood of his son. Maybe we should pray this week, this way. Forgive us as often as you want to be forgiven. <laughs> and if you haven't caught it yet, maybe I ought to stop and lay it out plainly. This prayer is about changing us from the inside out. Prayer is giving God permission to work inside of our hearts. It's recognizing God, his holiness, his, his might, his authority. And it's about changing my heart toward those who have hurt me. And now it's, it's changing my heart toward the attraction that sin has a hold on me. 
And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So much to say in so little time. The first phrase, lead us not into temptation, might be better understood as do not bring us to a time of trial. It's not so much about temptation as about overcoming very, very arduous difficulties. Don't put too much on my plate. God, remember my limitations. It could be a a cause clause. Do not cause us to go into trials. Or it could be a permission clause. Do not permit us to go there. It could refer to the role that God plays in our temptation. There's a fascinating dialogue in Job chapter 1. If you've never read it, I mean, Job is my hero. Job chapter 1, between God and Satan, in which God asks Satan what he's been up to. And Satan answered the Lord from roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. And then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? With pride, I can almost see it. You see, God draws attention specifically to Job. And God compliments him on his godly and righteous life. And Satan responds, sure, it's because you've made it so easy for him. And God gives Satan permission to attack. The Lord said to Satan, very well then, everything he has is in your power. But on the man himself, do not lay a finger. Could it be that this part of the prayer is asking God to set the limitations on how far Satan has permission to go in your life? This isn't don't let anything bad happen to me. This is God, you know exactly how much I can handle. You have provided me with the tools that I need. The Holy Spirit, the Word, godly people in my life. But you also know my limitations. Use me. Make me stronger. But protect me. Kenneth Bailey is a very wise Bible scholar. and He says it this way. We trust you to lead us because you know where we need to go. You know the way. We seek to carry out your will. We will follow close. And later versions of the prayer close with the very familiar, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. It all comes back to God. The prayer is to prepare our hearts to notice God at work, giving him permission to work in us and through us. Why don't we practice it right now as we have someone lead us in our closing prayer. Wonderful Jesus, you are worthy to be praised just for who you are, not for what you do. Bring it on. I give you permission. Take me where you want me to walk, even if all I do is care for the fatherless children. Help me show them heaven. When our business failed, you sustained us. I will. Walk confidently in your provision every day. Father, I have said and done all the wrong things in my life, hurting people in my path. Help me be as gracious going forward as you have been to me in the past and the present. Holy Spirit, when I filed for divorce, you sidelined me and prevented my failure in order to deliver me into success. Only your power, your glory, and your grace can show that kind of kingdom power. Lead us here today. Draw us into your redemptive power. Only you are savior and healer. Open our hearts that we might believe who you are in this word. Help us, Lord God, to turn away from our sin and run into your forgiveness. Let it be so.